Hello, hello. Welcome everyone to the Singularity Lab. I'm so excited. We've got an amazing show for you today. Your home for science, technology, breaking futurism. Uh, my name is Michael Madaluni. These are my co-hosts, Kristen Madaluni. We've got Luis Jimenez with us today and the one and only Rather Be Squidding. Welcome everyone. How you doing? Good, man. Doing well. Yeah. Uh, excited yeah. for this conversation. Yeah, it's going to be an amazing show. Um, we've got Ross Coldheart with us today. Uh, we're going to be discussing his new book, In Plain Sight, UFOs and Impossible Science. But before we do that, let's take a moment to discuss today's logical fallacy. In order to understand the world we live in and speculate about where we're headed, we need to shake off the mental cobwebs and approach new subjects with a clear head. And the fastest way to do that, rather be squidding, Krista Metaluni, Luis Jimenez, is to identify our own logical biases and cognitive fallacies. What is a logical fallacy, you ask? Why, I'll tell you. It's a pattern of reasoning rendered invalid by a flaw in its logical structure. A cognitive bias is a systemic error in thinking that occurs when people are processing and interpreting information in the world around them. Cognitive biases are often a result of your brain's attempt to simplify information processing, thus making it not your fault, but we can do better, ladies and gentlemen. Today's logical fallacy is the fallacy fallacy. The fallacy fallacy is presuming that because a claim has been poorly argued or a fallacy has been made that it is necessarily wrong. Example, recognizing that Amanda had committed a fallacy in arguing that we should eat healthy food because a nutritionist said it was popular, Elise said we should therefore eat bacon and double cheeseburgers every single day. Uh, I think it's a mm. great one for this conversation about UFOs because there is quite a bit of garbage out there when it comes to um, you know, facts and, and people getting to the truth when it comes to this phenomena. And I find it interesting that a lot of people write it off because they find, you know, one, one fallacy and then they write the entire thing off. What do you guys think? Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, but it's, you know, it's the conversation is kind of lends itself to that, uh, because there's mm. just not enough proof. There's not enough evidence, uh, for science to look at anyway. I think there's, um, there's a lot of, um, and maybe we could get into this with Ross, but like, there's a lot of, uh, I think guessing with this and sort of trying to put the pieces together and looking at it from, you know, stepping back and looking at the whole totality of what's happening and how there could not be anything to this story. Um, but there's nothing to pin it down and it's hard. It's hard. Right. Yeah. It kind of shows you, you know, you can have a debate on this topic and the winner of the debate a lot of people think, oh, that's the winning position, but that's not necessarily true, right? It's who debated better, who, you know, exposed fallacies exactly. in the other person's argument, but the truth is still potentially up in the air. Yeah, no, it's fascinating because you can, you can, you can find something to be false and then assume everything else behind it is false when it may or may not be. And I think that's really the beauty of what Ross has done with his new book really looking at this story from a journalistic perspective, digging deep and trying to get to the truth. And so we're all appreciative of that. And I'm, and I'm very excited to bring him in here. Before we do that, let's uh, say hello to some of you folks in the chat. Alex, how are you? Jason Brown, nice to see you. Robert, Justin, Jazz Shaw in the house, Bottled Water, Aaron Desario. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We've got an absolutely amazing show for you. For those of you who've been living under a rock, and you don't know Ross Coulthard. He is a multi-award winning investigative journalist with over three decades of experience in newspapers and television, including reporting for the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, ABC, and 60 Minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Ross Coulthard. Ross, how are you today? Good day. How are you? Good day. <laughs> oh, man, I love that he's here. Uh, that yeah. is with a good day. That's that's. Perfect. Well, I'm glad it's still a good day because we had a, an unfortunate blip with time zones and we accidentally had R Ross in the room a little early today. So we're, we're very sorry about that, Ross, but we're thrilled to have you. But Not as the professional he is, he waited around an hour. <laughs> he waited uh, actually, around an hour for us. I actually went off and had another cup of coffee and plowed through the mountain of material that I'm getting from people all over the world. I, my, every morning, my inbox is groaning with uh, new information. It's it's a great way to be, but it's also slightly overwhelming. When you were talking about when I popped into the room, you were talking about the Gulf Breeze sightings. And I'm from Florida. And in 1993 is when I had my sighting. 
And the closest thing I could compare it to is the Gulf Breeze craft. Um, oh, wow. Which is pretty wild uh, that you brought that up when you were talking about it, uh, when I popped in the room. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it is almost, that's exactly how I remember it is, is the, the image um of of i mean they, they i can't remember the gentleman's name who wrote the book on the gulf breeze sightings but there was a lot of really beautiful high quality images of the craft in there and uh it's pretty cool yeah somebody uh just overnight had emailed me the uh video imagery taken on i think it must be film or very good quality video of um the craft with beautiful silvery craft of some type or, or shall we say neutrally object uh, mm -hmm. But basically, whatever it was, it was uh, incredibly sharp. And um, I was looking at it uh, while I was waiting for you guys to wake up and, you know, come and find me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank God we did, man. Are you going to – what do you do with videos like that? Are you going to – do you think you'd share something like that? Just say, hey, this is pretty cool. I'd like to open source it and see whatever – Look, this is it. Maybe be able to find out about it. This is a real dilemma for me because yeah. one, one of the things that – because I come from a legal background, uh, any kind of evidence in my head, I always have to prove it. I have to determine provenance. So literally, unless I can see a, a stat deck or a, a, what you guys call an affidavit from the person who actually took that video saying, I recorded this video at this time in this position, looking up in this direction, it's next to useless, to be perfectly honest with you, right. as are most UFO videos or UAP videos, because frankly, all they show often, and it's hugely frustrating, are uh, fuzzy, indeterminate, blurry objects in the sky. And I've literally, I've, I have literally had thousands and thousands of these come in in the last few weeks. And a lot of people, you know, for them, they're obviously incredibly important experiences because they're sharing them with me often for the first time with anybody. And I, I don't want to be dismissive, but at the same time, they're so easily faked that mm. it's next, I, I, I'm not being pejorative, but it's next to useless as evidence in many ways, unless I can determine provenance. And so that's why I, I beg people when they, when they shoot these things, please record your, your grid reference, please record the direction you were shooting in. Put down as much detail as you can possibly do and make sure that's part of the, the metadata that's included with that imagery so that we know what you're talking about. Uh, I mean, I've, for example, I've, I, I just got another really interesting tip overnight. Um, have any of you ever read about that Calvine object in Scotland where two hikers allegedly saw... Um, some kind of craft hovering in the sky. And it's a blurry black and white photograph these days. Mm -hmm. But Nick Pope, for example, who ran the UFO desk at the MOD, the Ministry of Defence in London, has said that what he saw was a much sharper, very high quality image. Um, I was sent information this morning, which suggests to me that the British government put a D notice, which is essentially a gag order, on release of information about that object. And uh, uh, I've just responded to the person who'd emailed me that information. But um, it fascinates me because there's a lot of stuff like that coming in the door. And people, you know, they immediately assume I know what they're talking about. And, I mean, essentially, I knew the Calvine story because I've read about it. But uh, uh, one thing I beg with people is be scientific and methodical when you send somebody like me who's a simple plotter you know I'm a simple soul um, please please don't just send me a video send me the context of the video and explain the uh, the background to the whole circumstance in which it was shot um, or, or documents as well you know it's really important for me to know if you're sending me a document that you say has come from the National Archives in some country please give me the reference, the the bar node, the barcode number or, or the uh, the way of finding it so that I can cor corroborate its, co its, its provenance. So now that you're getting all of, you're being basically inundated, I, I can't even imagine what it must be like for the amount of information you're getting and, and just how difficult it must be to weed, um, weed through it all. What other sort of, when, I guess when you started writing your book, what sort of protocols, what sort of journalistic protocols do you use to weed out the, the bullshit? 
Okay, well, let me be flippant for a moment. If the letter has if if the letter has more than five stamps on it, I I, I think they're nuts. You know, it's um, it's one of the things in journalism is over the years, um, <laughs> if there's more than if there's more than three colours used in the handwritten document that you've been sent, then they're clearly not well. Mm. Uh, I, I, I and. Uh, you know, it's it's when they're writing in the in the columns as well as along across the page that that you know something's wrong. I mean, there are a lot of people who are drawn to the phenomenon in all seriousness who suffer from mental illness. I mean, it's a simple fact. It's a simple reality. You know, there are. I have friends who suffer from psychosis, and they're um, they're drawn to the phenomenon as a subject matter. And uh, but it's to to actually seriously address your question. The most important thing for me is to be able to get facts delivered in a way that somebody like me can tabulate. Uh, uh, I, at the moment, am very much just in the information gathering phase. Um, I literally every day get people sending me documents, photographs, videos, and Unless I can determine, as I've said with the videos, the provenance or the the actual date, the you know the actual source origin of the document or the video, it's next to impossible for me to do anything with it, and that's the problem I think with the world of um, ufology research. It has to become more scientific. Um, th there's a, a really big problem with a lot of crap out there uh, that, frankly. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's real or not, but the 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 issue is determining what's real and what's not real. In order to do that, I've got to be able to assess the provenance, the source of that material. So if somebody send, sends me something, I, I need their phone number, I need their email address, I need to know a rough account of what it was they saw and in what context they saw it, whether it was them that took the video or the photograph or whether it was somebody else, and if so, who that person was. And in many ways, it's a bit like being a police investigator, um, and it's basically how investigative journalism works. I mean, I'm, I use um, forensic software uh, that's very similar to what the police use where you're building a case on something. So, for example... Um, with Australian sightings, I'm I'm building pretty much like a, a a murder database, and so I can search across keywords. I can search across documents. Um, there's certain um, forensic database software applications that I've been taught how to use by, uh, funnily enough, ex cops uh, who are very very good at sorting data. And one of the problems any cop will tell you is uh, the phenomenon of just too much information because uh, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the immensity of data. When I first started doing my research into this subject matter, I'd, I'd periodically go into despair because I'd think I'd just got onto something and just started to understand it. And then somebody would send me another volume of information. I can remember reading the what I thought was the British Condine report, the Ministry of Defence Condine report. And I got to the end of it and then I realised it was only the first of, I think, five volumes. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. And so there's so much reading to do. And I'm I'm good at that because I, I, I used to be like an attorney or a, a barrister, as we call them here in Australia. Uh, and so you get used to reading huge volumes of data, huge amounts of information and, and crystallising it and understanding it. But one of the things you have to be absolutely sure of, especially in, in this subject matter, is making sure that the data is not bogus or hokum and fake. And, and unfortunately, there is a lot of fakery out there. So there's probably a lot of stuff that I've ditched, uh, you know, thrown away or ignored because I can't determine its provenance. And um, it's a real problem because a lot of people tend to take a screenshot of something that they've seen and then... They send it to me and they go, wow, look at this, you know, and I go, well, I have no bloody idea what you're talking about here. You know, you need to, you need to give me a, um, oh, sorry, is it okay to swear on this show? It I'm is. sorry. I just, it oh, is. We'd actually prefer I, 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 if you swear specifically. I, I, I'm very sorry to all my American friends because <laughs> I, I, in, in Australia, we swear like troopers, you know, seriously, it's, uh, 
<laughs> it's it's part of normal life here. And I've been quite shocked by how there's still a streak of Puritanism in my friends in America who, who seem morally offended by the fact that every now and then I'll let one go. And uh, it's, um, it's a bit of a worry because I noticed on social media, one of my family picked up on the fact that they were talking about how profane I'd been and somebody had made a little um, Twitter video, uh, a meme of me being profane and swearing <laughs> about Air Force generals. And... Uh, I'm trying to get on with the Pentagon, you guys. I'm trying to get them to give me all their secrets. And here you right. are, you know, you, you, all your mates are basically pointing out how foul-mouthed I am. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to lift my game. I'm going to start speaking right. more Well, would you Well, would you mind lifting your game after this show? Because you know, <laughs> yeah. this, is, <laughs> this is not the show to lift your game on. <laughs> we, prefer, sure. we prefer the profanity because, you know, it, it oftentimes speaks the truth. But do you think this is one of the reasons why – so many journalists stay away from this topic. A, there's so much crap to to weed through. Uh, there's so many people making things up. And then B, is it is it a matter of being on the outskirts with your peers? Do you do have have you had a hard time with that since writing this book? Look, to be honest with you, I, I've actually been pleasantly surprised. I braced myself for snide attacks from my colleagues in the media. I mean, I'm a fairly senior investigative journalist in this country, and um, I do have a few enemies. I mean, there's one person who took a swipe at me in a newspaper, and it was kind of like, oh, well, that's a bit pathetic, you know. And I, I, I didn't really mind, to be honest. I, I've been expecting quite major blowback. But look, the fact is as I hope we all do, I've dealt with facts. I mean, you know, when you're sourcing this stuff to National Archives documents, I mean, that's the biggest response I've had. I've, I've had probably a phone call a day from friends in media, not only here in Australia, but all around the world. I've, I'm a member of a group called ICIJ. In fact, the group just wrote the uh, Pandora's Papers, which is this big expose about the shonky people who are hiding their money in trusts and Virgin Islands and places like that. Right. And um, those guys, we know we all share information internationally. And it's a, it's a wonderful way of collaborating as a journalist. And we do it all on tales or on Proton Mail. And it's all very super, super secret and encrypted. And a number of them, God bless them, have been getting back to me in the last few weeks and saying, hey, Ross, you've written a book about UFOs. And then they're all privately, without exception, saying to me, yeah, yeah, I once spoke to somebody in our Air Force or our military or our government about that, and they, they told me there was something to it, but I've kind of stayed away from it because it's it's weird. It's, it's so taboo, you know. And it's interesting because I don't want to sound like a complete nutter, but I think there's been a very deliberate disinformation campaign waged against journalists, against mainstream journalists, to try and discourage them from going into this subject matter. Who's and the reason I mentioned that? I, I look, I mean, I, I know, for example, I've seen here in Australia, I've seen documents that show how um, people have deliberately given false information to the media to shut down an investigation into an incident. For example, the, the Kaikoura UFO incident, which I write about in my book, which is a 1978, Christmas 1978. I, I remember watching this story go to air in New Zealand as a little boy, because I lived there when I first uh, was growing up. And um, I can remember this amazing film of these objects coming up to the side of a cargo aircraft flying up the South Island, the coast of the South Island of New Zealand. And I remember the initial excitement all around the world. It just went nuts in that silly season period around Christmas time because there was no other stories. And that's the time of the year when those sort of stories take off. And then I remember the New Zealand Air Force shut it down with a report that came out just a few weeks later. And the prime minister of the day did a press conference. And it was all announced that it was just inversions, temperature inversions of clouds, reflections of lights off the water. And, you know, for my non-scientific brain and for most people in New Zealand, including people in the media, you kind of bought that as the explanation. And it wasn't until I went through in my research and actually looked through the archives files in New Zealand and found the names of the people who'd purportedly been spoken to. And then I went and spoke to those people. And they told me 
this is a lie. I, you know, these things weren't said. And for example, one of them was a guy called John Cordy, who was the radar operator in Wellington Air Traffic Control, which was across Cook Strait at the bottom of the North Island of New Zealand from where this incident took place. And the claim was made by the New Zealand Air Force that the Wellington Airport radar was faulty that night and that the imagery that they'd picked up was just backscatter and faulty imagery. That was bullshit. Because when I went and spoke to Cordy and one of his colleagues, it turned out their their radar was perfectly functioning. Uh, he he attested to the fact that what he saw was an object that was clearly tracking this aircraft at 14,000 feet. And simultaneously with my friend Quentin Fogarty, who sadly passed away last year, and another guy called Dennis Grant, who was another journalist who was on the plane with Quentin, they were saying that they could see the object in front of the cockpit through the window at the very same time that the guy in Wellington Airport across Cook Strait could see it on his radar in exactly that position. Mm. And, uh, and yet the New Zealand Air Force published a report that was published across New Zealand asserting categorically that this was just a faulty radar, go away, folks, nothing to see here. And, and that's something that's happened time and time again. For example, just this morning, I mentioned Calvine, the Scottish uh, incident where there was this amazing photograph that was allegedly given to a Scottish newspaper, which then disappeared. And apparently there was clearly some kind of official crackdown. And I still haven't investigated this, but you know, the guy who sent it to me overnight literally told me that what he sent me is an excerpt from a government document which shows that there was a D-notice imposed. And D-notices are something that in the British Commonwealth were quite widely used by governments to suppress information that is uh, possibly in breach of a national security order. And um, we don't have them anymore, frankly, and it's um, I think our Defence Department would quite like the idea of us being able to be suppressed and stopped from publishing stories with D-notices, but I think the media would tell them to go jump these days. But back in the Cold War, it was quite routine right. for government officials to turn up to an editor of a newspaper and issue a D-notice. And so what I read was essentially that a D-notice was imposed on this incident. And I'm still to check it out, so don't run away and publish just yet. But um, uh, it's, um, you know, it's interesting to me. I've, I've seen the reality, which is that the biggest and most effective thing of all that stops the media, the mainstream media, from engaging with this subject matter is the taboo. And I've pretty much had to do a master's degree in ufology to get across the volume of data. And it's taken me two or three years to develop an understanding of the subject matter and to sort out the, the wheat from the chaff, if you like. Yeah. And once you've discounted the crazies and got rid of the hoaxes and the frauds, and there are a lot, um, there is a really solid kernel of truth that runs through this. And that was the that was the revelation for me is that, um, you know, you can't dispute files, government files that record objects on radar, multiple radar systems um, flying at thousands of miles an hour or kilometers an hour as it is in my country. And, and interestingly, I'm not talking about the Tic Tac here. I'm talking about incidents that occurred in the 1950s that are recorded in both British archives, Australian archives, Canadian archives, French archives, and American archives. You know, all of our countries around the world have had these experiences which have been methodically recorded and perplexed military and expert observers. And one of the one of the things that I think is most effective in terms of deterring the media has been the ridicule and taboo that has been attached to the subject matter for so long. And uh, look, the only way that the media is going to start engaging with this and start taking it seriously, and, and that's starting to happen, is if we do what I suggest, which is stop embracing loony stuff, you know, dump the crazy shit. I mean, I don't 
care if people say they've been on spaceships to Zeta Reticuli. It's completely unprovable, and ufology shouldn't be giving it an airing. It's nonsense mm. in my book until I see the proof. There, said it. You know, I, I, <laughs> there, I said it. Well, I mean, oh. some, some people you would know. say the same about alien uh. craft, right? Recovered alien craft. I, I, I agree. And and the bottom line is we cannot be determinate about that. We cannot right. be absolutely determinate. But in that case, the distinction is, for example, myself, I, I have at least one government official who's gone on the record with me for my book, Nat Kovitz, the former Director of Science and Technology Development. And I have others who've spoken to me confidentially on background who are unwilling to destroy themselves by going public. Um, you also have to take into account the assertions made by respected security cleared scientists like Dr. Eric Davis. And look, frankly, if nobody's read this stuff, they really should. Joe Mergia, UFO Joe, has done a phenomenal job. I was just reading it yesterday, um, transcribing everything that Eric Davis, for example, has said, this is a guy who works for Aerospace Corporation, which is a federally funded research corporation. So this is a, and a corporation that is run as an aerospace company with government money. In order to work there, you have to have a top secret SCI clearance. He's trusted with, you know, intimate, important secrets that are vital to your country's national security. He has got on the record and asserted that he's aware of a UFO crash retrieval program. And I think that's significant. And so that's that's why there's a distinction. You know, you've got officials on the record. And this is where I think there is a change happening because I, I've had people contact me from mainstream media in your country, uh, had a call from somebody on the LA Times yesterday. And, and they'd read my book and I think we'd sent them a preview copy. And they were actually ringing me to verify the provenance of something that I'd written in my book because they were absolutely flummoxed by the fact that I'd written it. You know, they, they weren't aware of it. And I think they were a little peeved that an Australian investigative journalist had reported it and they, they'd not come across it themselves. One of the other things which, you also which, have which to be is, aware of. What was that? What was specifically, what were they calling you about? I didn't. I, I don't recall telling you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did it, but could you recall? <laughs> well, I'm yeah. sorry, no, I, but 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 one of the things also, <laughs> one of the things also that I have to explain to you is, um, I've reported on national security and terrorism and defence issues, and one of the things that um, is a real problem in America in particular, is a lot of your national security and defense and terrorism, counterterrorism correspondents are dependent on their sources for the information that they get. So, you know, you'll get, say, the New York Times running massive stories about um, the Iranian, Iranian nuclear weapons program. Now, the people that are leaking that to them are semi-official. You know, that sort of thing's done often on a semi-official basis. More often than not, it's done out of the director of the CIA office, and then they all express alarm and shock when it's published in the media. You know, there are strategic reasons why information is published by people who write about national security and defence. And as a reporter, you have to be open to why you're being given information sometimes. And perhaps the best illustration of this is the completely untrue information that was put out by my intelligence services, the British intelligence services, and also by America about the Iraqi nuclear weapons, uh, weapons of mass destruction program, which were completely wrong. Um, so one of the issues to respond to your question that is a problem, mainstream media are dependent, sorry, just getting rid of, mainstream media are dependent on being fed that information. Like you're only ever as good as your source. And so one of the problems is being with being a, a national security reporter working that round, that gig in the Pentagon or wherever you're working it, is you're dependent on that relationship with that senior official who feeds you information. And if you upset them by publishing a story that they don't want published about, say, UAPs, 
it, 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 it's something that affects your ability to get future information. And so I think there are actually real constraints on the ability of a lot of the people reporting in national security and defence to be able to talk about these issues. Um, because, frankly, it's, it's blatantly obvious to me that there's been a real effort um, at the highest levels of your government in particular to stop the media from asking questions about certain sightings and certain incidents. And look, it may very well be that this is because the United States is working in the black on some new super secret game changer, ace in the hole technology that they'll pull out of the hat in the event of a confrontation, say, with China in the Taiwan Strait. I've got no idea. But, you know, I, I love to think that something new might be coming out of Area 51 or Nevada Lake um, uh, in, in, the, in the next five to ten years. Because why would the US want to suppress, if, if, the, if the explanation for this phenomenon is extraterrestrial or, or non-human, uh, why would they want to suppress it? Uh, and so that's why I, I still hold out the possibility that what we're talking about here is still potentially technology that's being worked on in the black by the American government in particular, but also in cooperation with governments like mine and the British. Well, and you and, mentioned and I, earlier that this is, you know, there there is deliberate disinformation. And the question is why? And you also brought up this idea of national security and the potential for super secret technology. And I think these are all valid and legitimate considerations that we should all be thinking about. Obviously, there would be a reason for the government to keep hidden black ops, black projects, and they're not going to be honest with us. And, and you know, the expectation that we, they would be honest with us is not something we should we should even consider, because obviously they have to keep their national security in check. Do you think this there is there any reason that a government would want to keep any sort of possibility that if this were some sort of extraterrestrial phenomenon, do you think there's a good reason to push that down? Do you think there's a good reason to uh, use disinformation on that? Or is that an excellent way to use disinformation against the people? Okay, everything I say here is speculative. I'm not yeah. saying I know, okay. Right. Um, but, you know, certain people in your defense and intelligence establishment have ventured different theories, none of which yet I buy. Uh, I've actually openly, and one of the things you do as a journalist when you get given information is, I mean, I don't want to do anything. I regard myself as being patriotic to the extent of making sure that I don't do something that jeopardizes my country's national security. And um, you know, the imperatives of both America and Australia are very similar in the sense that we're, we're, demo we're democracies, we're free and open countries that enjoy constitutional freedoms and rights, and we want to protect those. And there are authoritarian regimes like Russia and China and nut job regimes like North Korea that mean as bad. And, and it's important that we don't do things when we're reporting as journalists to jeopardize those national security imperatives. And right. So I actually, over the years as a journalist, I've I've been given stuff that I know I shouldn't have. Um, I can remember on one occasion I was I was given information that Australian troops were about to be deployed on a very sensitive mission overseas. And I checked it with sources in the Defence Department who told me that, frankly, I shouldn't know that. It was true, and they'd prefer that I didn't run it. And that's exactly what we did. We didn't run it. And so in this case, I've invited people in your national security, intelligence, defense, infrastructure. I've actually sat like this and said, give me one good reason why the public can't know what you know. And the first explanation they normally venture is that if the public knew what they knew, there might be a mass panic. And I don't buy I actually, it. no, I, Do I, you? I, I, I I, I don't buy it either. And in fact, yeah. I got really annoyed with the person who said that to me. I said, look, I'm sorry, I just don't buy that. I, 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 in, in fact, it infuriates me. It's condescending, it's arrogant, and it's, it's, it's you guys basically making a decision that you have no right to make. You know, the public should be told this stuff. And, and you know, I've flatly confronted 
people uh, that I believe there is a cover-up, and they've frankly agreed with me that there is an unwillingness to tell the whole story. And look, as we know, you know, there are now people on the record, like Lou Elizondo, who say that the government, for example, is sitting on videos that it hasn't yet released. And I've been apprised by other people of what I understand is on some of those videos, and they show incredibly sharp, high-resolution imagery of craft, objects that are clearly intelligently manoeuvring around military aircraft. Now, why would the US government suppress that? Could it be, and this is the one I favour, we, we, we have a, a saying in my line of work, which is always assume a screw-up before a conspiracy. We actually say something more vulgar, but you guys are so sensitive. I won't use the words I normally use, but um, <laughs> but you know, essentially, always always assume a screw up before a conspiracy. And so, I assume that the military and the defence intelligence people that are basically sitting on this information just don't want to admit, in the main, that they are as perplexed about this phenomenon as you and I are, and it's been a mystery for them. And if you read the documents, it's certainly consistent with an analysis of the historical documents. You know, if you go back and look at what people like your former CIA director, the founding director of the CIA, Roscoe Hillencotter, was he founding? Certainly one of the early directors of the CIA, Roscoe Hillencotter, who, who went on to run a UFO transparency group, NICAP. Um, he... he openly talked about the fact that this was a mystery inside the military that was unresolved and, you know, that this was real and, and that it needed investigation. That's the one I favour at the moment, that, that you have people, we have people in our defence as well, who, who frankly just don't like admitting that for all the billions of dollars that we spend on trying to protect us from potential threats, well, here is a potential threat. Here is a potential threat that can shut down or indeed turn on ICBM nuclear missiles. It can uh, remotely interfere with technology if you believe the contents of slide nine, which was provided in a briefing to the Under Secretary of Defense. You know, it's capable of the five minute of the the five observables, you know, the incredible hypersonic speeds and extraordinary right angled maneuvers with no change in velocity. Um, you know, this is a phenomenon that is clearly intelligently controlled, uh, doing stuff that is apparently beyond known human aerospace technology. So there's a mystery there. And could it be as simple as they just don't like admitting? that for all the money we're giving them, for all the stupid, senseless wars they've dragged us into in the last 30 or 40 years, this one biggest mystery of all, they can't provide us with an answer. Now, I, I tend to favour that one in the main. But then I'm increasingly of the view that there is a coterie of people at the very apex of your defence intelligence establishment, and perhaps also in other governments. I doubt in mine. Uh, I think there maybe is one or two people in our intelligence services who are briefed into it, but not as much as in yours. But I do believe on the balance of probabilities that the US knows a hell of a lot more than they're saying. In, than it's letting on. And and the reason I think that is because Nat Kobitz told me he was briefed into the program. He was read into a craft retrieval program. And as a journalist, I can't ignore that. And I can't ignore the evidence that I've been given by other people who I've spoken to confidentially, who've told me that they either worked or are working in the program and that there is an active attempt to back engineer retrieved non-human technology. And then I look at the overt comments that have been made by people like Lou Elizondo, the former head of the Pentagon's UFO investigation program, where he talks openly about his suspicion that there is a recovered technology that is possibly of non-human origin. I mean, he said that, Eric Davis has said that, other sources have said that to me. Um, 
people like Nat Kobitz said that to me. Something's going on. But I suspect if it is happening, it's been hidden in private aerospace for reasons that I can't discuss publicly. Um, uh, and I, I think that when most people in government say this is a mystery, they're telling the truth including wouldn't that, presidents wouldn't that be i mean i agree with you i don't think it's their right to hold this hot this information hostage behind this veil of secrecy but at the same time i could understand not wanting to open that can of worms publicly because you're not going to have answers to a lot of the questions that are going to start to be asked um and yeah. that could cause a i mean just in 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 michael's state in florida <laughs> florida is definitely a uh a wild card when it comes to stuff like this but when when the gas lines were hacked and people were freaking out about gas, they started putting gasoline in plastic bags because <laughs> they thought they weren't going to get gasoline. Um, and so this idea of putting this information out might not cause panic. I don't know about that because people went crazy buying toilet paper when a pandemic hit. So it's I, I can kind of sympathize a little bit with the powers that be. But yeah, go mm. ahead. You're going to say. Well, uh, look, there's, there's two answers. Firstly, I want to respond to DT, who's made a very good observation on the uh, on the chat. You know, he's he's asking me, is it possible that Lou Elizondo is a disinformation agent and that what, what this is all about is possibly the US government trying to fire a, a whiff of grape shot across the bows of any potential adversary um, to confuse rivals about the extent of US knowledge of uh, its capabilities? That is a possibility. I mean, I doubt it. To be honest, because of other things I know, uh, but yeah, I mean, we, I mean, Lou by training is a counterintelligence operative who would have been trained in disinformation, and so yeah, we we have to be aware of that possibility. Um, and as a journalist, I'm wise to that possibility, and I've acknowledged that possibility in my book and in pretty much every speaking engagement that I've made. Um, just coming back to that point that you were just making, though, Lewis, uh, I, I I think. Um, if I was the president of the United States and I was briefed into the program that I, on the balance of probability, suspect does exist, I would understand immediately the importance of preserving the security and the confidentiality of this to stop my rivals like China and Russia from mounting incredibly aggressive espionage operations to try and crack the secrets of whatever that program is. You know, I'm not, I'm not arguing for confidentiality as a journalist, but I can kind of understand why the first instinct of governments might be to keep everything secret. I mean, I, I come from a, a British culture of secrecy where the Brits keep bloody near everything secret. You know, there's a, the, uh, the, when I did law, uh, one of the things we were taught about was the Official Secrets Act and the way it operates in Commonwealth countries. And, you know, it was pointed out to us that even the menu in the cafeteria of the Department of Defence, because it's an official government document, is strictly speaking a government secret and you can't reveal it. And, and it gets absurd to the extent to which things are kept secret inside the British Commonwealth, you know, there's no excuse for it, and it's appalling. But in your country, one of the things I really admire is that there is a uh, there is an executive class in your government that understands the importance of constitutional rights and accountabilities. And as much as possible, you do have an accountability structure for even your black programs. And I, I, I guess I'm not making excuses for it, but one of the things that is a possibility in my mind is that yeah, the US knows a hell of a lot more about what the phenomenon is than it's letting on. It is back in engineering technology and maybe let's just assume for a moment that its efforts to back engineer that technology have not been all that successful, which is what I've been told. You wouldn't want to give your adversaries the edge by even admitting possession of that technology. Why, why would you? You know, I, I, I'm not making excuses for these people because they've certainly lied to Congress. They've they've allowed presidents to lie on their behalf from the White House. The public has been egregiously misled. If if this is the case, um, you know, the public has been lied to. It's probably a criminal act to have committed the contempt of Congress that's been perpetrated here. 
But let's assume there's a presidential executive order that goes back to Truman or Eisenhower or one of the earlier presidents, which basically says, this shall be kept secret for as long as a president deems it shall be kept secret or as long as the gatekeepers of that secret deem it shall be kept secret in order to protect the importance of this very, very valuable technology. I can understand that. I'm not making excuses for it, but I can understand right. it. I, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd probably be tempted to do the same thing if I was the, uh, if I was the U.S. government. So, well, assuming uh, this is a yeah. worldwide phenomenon, though, wouldn't it have to be kind of an international secret and international cooperation to keep this secret from the, the public? Yeah. Look, I've I've had people talk to me about that. They've claimed that there's a secret agreement between Russia and uh, America, and that it was negotiated during the Cold War, and. I've actually asked Russian former military commanders about this directly, you know, very senior people just recently and, and, and put it on them, you know, you know, is there some kind of secret agreement? You know, there were even claims of secret meetings between Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan in a submarine, you know, wacky <laughs> stuff. Um, but um, if that's true, I'd certainly love to hear the evidence, uh, but I haven't seen the evidence. So, you know, bottom line is... Um, why would two, even at the best days of the Cold War, why would two former Cold War rivals agree to collaborate on something like this? I don't know. I mean, maybe there's that lovely Ronald Reagan quote where Ronald Reagan talked to the United Nations about how imagine if there was, you know, an external alien threat, how much it might bring human society together. Uh if we forgot our nationalistic identi identities, if we if we became aware of a threat from outside, um, I don't know. You said that was Literally, the only way, right? That, that's the yeah. only way the world would come together. Yeah, I mean, and so yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know the answer, but basically, I'm I'm skeptical of claims of international agreements. I do know, and I've confirmed this very recently, I do know that there is information sharing on UAPs between the Five Eyes Alliance. So that's between the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and to some degree also Japan. There is information sharing uh, uh, that involves objects that cannot be explained. But the people that I've spoken to aren't suggesting to me that there is a a huge degree of knowledge belied by what those intelligence reports show. They just suggest that this is a mysterious object that's been tracked moving in this particular area of sky or orbit. It can't be explained. Put it in the files and forget about it. Yeah, I think, uh, Ross, you make a really good point about the international agreement. I mean, it's hard enough to keep a secret within one nation. To keep a secret yeah. within multiple nations is a huge challenge. And then you mentioned something earlier about the bureaucracies and always, uh, you know, imagine bureaucracy and and idiot um, mistakes before you before you think conspiracy, because we, we do have so many bureaucracies and they do lie to cover up themselves. And then what happens is we live in an age of conspiracy theorists, right? And part of that is yeah. because we're being lied to. So we fill in the blanks and then we have social media, which creates these bubbles. And then you have these echo chambers of conspiracies and then they get, they compound exponentially. What do you, how how do you counteract this? I mean, what what do you do when you're right? You know, how did you approach this subject to to try to unravel this mystery and not get caught up in that? Okay, one of the things I did was I went to source. So I mean, I'm I'm I I, I know it sounds boring, but I've spent hours, days, months going through old archive documents. Uh, you know, there is a phenomenal amount of information in the French Cometa report. I, I speak French, so I, I was able to go through the French uh, documents that provided the basis for a lot of the Cometa report, which is the French semi-official semi report that was published by a whole series of former defence and intelligence officials into what took place in France. Um, similarly with the Condine report in the UK, and then the vast amount of information that's in the British Public Record Office, the National Archives, and then in Australia's National Archives, and then finally in your National Archives, there is a huge body of scientific evidence which shows that the phenomenon was 
has been and is being taken very seriously by all of our military intelligence and defence people. Um, no matter what they say publicly, um, these objects are a, an issue of concern. I mean, for example, in Australia, we were testing a bit like your Nevada test range when the British decided to test their nuclear bombs. They very kindly agreed to let us use our Maralinga Desert, which is in the middle of South Australia, in the middle of nowhere, to explode and test their nuclear weapons. They also were testing their ICBM missiles, their intercontinental missiles. And so I don't think it's a coincidence that the reports from our archives show incredible numbers of objects clearly intelligently controlled apparently monitoring these nuclear tests and the same thing was reported by your scientists at places like los alamos um, the places where you were reprocessing uranium and a lot of this stuff is recorded in the very early days when i think there was a much greater degree of openness inside the American government in the 1940s and the 1950s. And then you can see that what started to happen as the Cold War got hotter, I think there was a very clear decision made, and this is evidenced by the CIA's own archives from the CIA library. There was a very, very clear decision made to try and suppress public awareness of the phenomenon. They stopped talking about it. Generals stopped giving press conferences about it. Or when they did talk about it, they poo-pooed it. They ridiculed it and treated it as a, a subject to be treated with ridicule. And that's when the mainstream media's current attitudes towards the phenomenon kicked in. And what I'm arguing and what I'm trying to say persuasively to a lot of my professional colleagues is that's a historical view now, which has no, it should have no quarter in the current environment when the Pentagon has formally admitted the phenomenon is real. Right. They've acknowledged, they've, they've acknowledged the reality of UAPs. And I, I, I've actually said to colleagues on major newspapers in your country and in mine, in the last few months, I've said, I don't know why you're not deploying your best investigative reporters to start digging into this issue. And all credit to the New York Times, the um, Tom Rogan, Washington Examiner, uh, Brian Bender on Politico. You know, there's a few, there's a very small handful of people in mainstream media in your country who've done a bit of digging. But you really do need, I think, to start going through the history and looking at the history of American sightings. And it's there. I mean, you know, you, you don't need off the record sources who are working in the current program. There's enough there, I think, to be able to satisfy yourself more than the balance of probabilities. I think beyond reasonable doubt on a criminal burden of proof that there is a reality that the United States has been aware of since at least the 1940s, um, that it's been engaging with very, very seriously. And look, you know, I've spoken to people whose organizations publicly maintain a, a mendacious and deliberately misleading position on UAPs, who frankly admit to me that the phenomenon is real, that they know a great deal more than they're prepared to admit publicly. And they cite privately to me a whole series of national security imperatives. But when I try and drill down and say, okay, well, let's talk about that. I can understand you might want to keep a, a secret Aurora craft or a TR-3B craft secret if you've developed such technology in the black. Is that what you're saying? And then there's this kind of pregnant <laughs> pause, you know. Kind of what and, and, Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, and I think too often, I mean, this worked during the Cold War, you know, quite often uh, in my younger days in journalism, people would say to me, look, Ross, I can't tell you why, but you really shouldn't publish that because that could jeopardize something that's a very important national security issue. And that happened to me twice in my early career. And I don't know if I'd buy that these days. You know, mm. I mean, you know, you've got to be skeptical about assertions of national security and, and threat, um, especially when 
we now know that we were blatantly lied to. I mean, I, I often say this to people about the Iraq war. I've got friends who've suffered terrible PTSD injuries as a result of their service in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I mean, both those wars were driven on falsehoods. You know, it's, it's particularly the um, Iraq war. You know, the Iraq war was driven by a completely false belief that Iraq, that Iraq Saddam Hussein still had nuclear weapons. And in Afghanistan, we allowed what was essentially a reprisal against a terror group called Al Qaeda to turn into a, a broader civil war against the Taliban, who aren't particularly nice human beings and an execrable bunch of hateful uh, Islamists. But the bottom line is they were sitting in the White House only a few months previous, um, you know, we were trying to be friends with the Taliban and all of a sudden we found ourselves in a war with them. And we've spent the last 20 years trying to extricate ourselves from a war that frankly we had no part of getting involved in. And so governments do say things on the grounds of national security that are misleading, deceitful, mendacious, and, and we should be... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this, Ross. Uh, we have a $20 uh, super chat uh, from Apple. By the way, Is thank the you, everybody. I was just say real quick, yes. thank you, everybody, yeah, for ahead. the super chats. We see them. Uh, we're, we're, some of them, Ross has already eloquently answered just naturally in the conversation. So if uh, if we didn't specifically uh, get to it, and that's why. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And also Is feel the- free if, if we didn't get to yours to, to ask again, we'll, we'll look into it. Um, the question is, is the image on the cover of In Plain Sight a toroid, a nod to nucleus diagram from McDonald Gateway Report, a node to Jack Valet dimension cover, simply an eye, or something else? All three, all four, uh, oh. to be honest. Uh, we, we agonized about the cover because I, I've, you know, I've got friends who've told me it's a very boring cover. Um, and uh, I guess I liked the idea of an eye, uh, but I also liked the toroid shape, which is what your correspondent refers to. Um, I'm not aware of the McDonald uh, Douglas reference that he makes there, but uh, yeah, I mean, we played with a whole lot of shapes. I guess I was drawn to it because uh, it evokes mystery. Uh, and when I was asked to approve it, which is the way it works with publishers, they design the cover and they come back to you. I'd given them a whole series of ideas and we talked about an eye we talked about disc shapes and toroidal shapes and elliptical shapes, and that was what was coming, what came back. Uh, but no, it's 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 not a mysterious allusion to um, any particular report. Although I, I have spent a lot of time digesting everything that Jacques Vallée has written, and uh, I absolutely love his Forbidden Science volumes. I, I think they're an incredible resource. Thank you. Uh, I did have a question about media before you get to Akashi Chris's question. Yep. Um, it seems to me, and I don't understand why mainstream media is not picking up on this, because I think nowadays it's fair to say that mainstream media runs off of clicks and ad revenue. And the more eyeballs they have, the better it is for them. When 60 Minutes puts out you know, a 13, 14 minute special on this topic, it's the most viewed thing on their YouTube page. It's the most shared thing that they've had in months. So why isn't that these these um, uh, producers, news programmers are going? Whoa, wait a second! We just got twelve million hits on a on a on a piece we put out yesterday. Uh, let's do another one. Like. W- <laughs> Why don't I don't understand why they don't see the dollar signs in it and start putting some better investigators on it or not better, but the ones that people will listen to uh, in order to get more clicks, more ad revenue, more money, more eyeballs, more credibility, especially if they're right on this topic. Um, I feel like it's a missed I, opportunity. I, I agree with you. And and if, I think that that is changing. I mean, uh, for example, the, the documentary that I made, which we've now got up on YouTube called The UFO Phenomenon, mm-hmm. um, I, I presented that on national television here in Australia uh, on the Seven TV network. And it's on a, a channel called Seven Spotlight on YouTube. But that's now been seen in its different iterations, both on free-to-air, 
on the download on the Seven Networks app and also on YouTube in two iterations over six million times, which for Australia is like an unbelievable quantity of viewers. I mean, it's easily the most viewed item ever on that on that program's website, on the Spotlight TV show's website. And I can tell you that individually, the producers that I worked with to make that program, uh, the executive producer, the, the editor of the show, they're as keen as must for more stories because they, they've seen that they're a ratings winner. Um, uh, but fundamentally, what you're up against is it costs enormous amounts of money. I mean, I, 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 I think the gods shone munificently on me when I pitched that particular story to them late right. last year. And you said, got an okay, hour, would... an hour program. Actually, it's, it's, it's over an hour. It's an it's, hour and a yeah. half. Yeah. Um, and, and look, that went to air on national TV in Australia and it really held its audience. <laughs> yeah. And I, and the, the thing that I'm humbled by and excited by as a journalist is the one thing you hope for as a journalist, you know, the one thing, the one thing that makes you despair sometimes is your work, your work, your, butt off investigating a story and you'll put it to air thinking it's the biggest thing since Woodward and Bernstein <laughs> and you know you know this is the Watergate that's going to crack it and it goes to air and everybody goes oh yeah yeah so what you know, and the thing that really blew me away and I'm excited by with the UFO story is we did a story that tried to objectively tell what we know for sure and dealing with facts you know hard evidence and we presented it and the response has been overwhelming absolutely just in fact exhausting and that's very very gratifying and so believe me the management of seven news media in australia know that and they're begging me for more stories on that issue but the um, the reality is that in the rest of the mainstream media there is still this incredible taboo you know a lot of the editors are men mainly men but also women of my generations and you know we've been stooped and acculturated in the notion that ufo stories uap, UAP stories are bullshit and there's no good reason for that. But, you, you know, one of the most effective ways of killing a story is to treat it with ridicule. And if I could only show you as a journalist, I mean, I can remember at the Sydney Morning Herald when I once pitched a UFO story, I was shown a, a folder that had all the UFO stories that were coming in. And, you know, there was just page after page of really ill people making wild, deranged allegations. And so this is a subject matter that does draw a lot of people with mental illness. It also draws a lot of Walter Mitty's, people who make completely false claims. And I, one of the things I think that um, discredits ufology is when ufology conferences put people on podiums and i know that there's just not a shred of evidence for what they're asserting and i'm not going to name them but it, it really infuriates me that 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 a subject matter that should be being engaged with scientifically is allowing itself to be led by the nose by rubbish hoaxes and, and I mean, there's one going at the moment. I won't say who, but you know, there's there's claims being made at the moment that are that are you know feeding the Twitterverse, and and people respond to it. And I think it's because social media is one of those things that just amplifies everything, regardless of the quality of the information. And part of this is is Facebook's fault as well, because their their algorithms drive that kind of senseless. Uh, pursuit for more and more and more data, mm -hmm. uh, but it it just behoves us all to be more scientific, to sit back and go, you know what, not going there. That, that's rubbish. You know, until we see hard evidence, by all means, give us hard evidence. Then I'll engage. You know, show me the show me the uh, the, the evidence to show that we really have sent people to other star systems. You know, mm. I mean. I mean, why in God's name are UFO conferences giving credence to those kind of allegations? It's it's well, ridiculous. And, uh, yeah. 
Where, where do you feel like things like uh, remote viewing fit in with that? You know, like Harold Putoff, who is Eric Davis's mentor and is very involved in all of this scientific research. You know, he was you know the forerunner, the the main guy behind the government's research into remote viewing, which kind of seems to me kind of falls right in between there in the spectrum of the UFO nuts and bolts and then the alien abduction phenomenon. And I guess kind of wondering yeah, where you would place that in this spectrum. Again, uh, I've got an open mind on remote viewing because um, uh, if you go into the CIA ar ar archives, you can read through their archives and they are claiming that they got better than random results using remote viewing where they were able to visualize secret Russian facilities that could not conceivably have been seen by those remote viewers, where they drew, for example, and I'm thinking here of a drawing of a, a massive crane structure that was drawn by one of the alleged remote viewers. And it blew everybody away because, um, you know, it was a... Uh, it was a structure that could not have conceivably been known about by that person unless they'd seen the very classified satellite telemetry that they'd already obtained. Um, similarly, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, openly acknowledged, I think, in one interview, and uh, there's documents to support this as well in the CIA's archives, that um, uh, he was briefed about a remote viewing exercise that helped find a downed Russian plane that was recovered by US intelligence and brought back to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in a secret operation. Um, so again, the reason why I would not rule out remote viewing, I'm not saying it's real, but I wouldn't rule it out either, is because, precisely because the CIA spent an inordinate amount of money investigating it and their own documents assert that they were getting results that could not be dismissed, that were were showing real, verifiable phenomena. Uh, I appreciate that there's been movies starring George Clooney made which poo-poo and lampoon the whole thing. Uh, but interestingly, I've never seen in any of the journalism, including in John Rodson's book, because John's somebody I respect enormously, uh, you know, he he um, he wrote the book that prompted the movie. Um, I would have liked to have seen a little more rigor in terms of acknowledging the fact that the CIA's own files say that this is real. Mm. And I mean, it's better had, than random, right? Yeah, right. And and I've I've had conversations with people who assert the benefits of remote viewing. Now, just because they tell me that doesn't mean I believe it. Right. Because, you know, one of the things I'm always wise to is the possibility that this was just another way for the Russians to be tricked into spending an inordinate amount of money on, you know, investigating something that was a complete waste mm -hmm. of time. Uh, and there were a lot of tricks like that during the Cold War where the US essentially bankrupted the Soviets by forcing them to their knees in the Cold War by basically encouraging them to spend more and more money on nuclear parity when, frankly, they were being fooled. And, uh, you know, there was an inordinate amount of money wasted. And that, that's pretty much how we won the Cold War, by disinformation. So there's always the possibility that, that remote viewing is disinformation. I just don't know. I really don't know. I've, I, I wish I could say for sure, but I was blown away again by the fact that all of the um, project files from most of what SRI, the corporation, was doing with Hal Putoff back in the 1970s and 80s uh, has been declassified and is sitting in the CIA archives. And if you actually go through those files and look at them very closely, then they're claiming better than random results. I really appreciate, Ross, how you approach these subjects with both an open mind, but an incredibly discerning mind. I think that's where in this conversation about ufology, in this conversation about UAPs, remote viewing, all of these things are open to interpretation and none of us know the truth. But if you if you close your mind, you can't even do the research. Um, if you're, if your mind is too open, then you just believe everything and you're just a patsy. Uh, let me ask you this. Akashi Chris says, uh, if intention unknown based on, uh, your research, what are your thoughts on tracking UAP frequencies, interfering with them 
Um, I know you've mentioned before, you've talked about this frequency thing and you've talked about how the military or sources uh, have talked about how the military has used the, this frequency um, to detect, to track UAP. Possibly um, bring them down. <laughs> possibly bring them down. And, and I, I even heard, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and this may not even be true, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that Eric Davis actually mentioned that that's something he didn't want you talking about. Is that accurate? Actually, no. Uh, let me first explain. Um, yes, I was told, and I quote in my book a guy called Bob Fish, who uh, gives a first-person account of how he was briefed on data, data, I think you guys call it over there. Uh, which <laughs> we use both. Basically shows the um, way in which a certain frequency uh, was used to detect anticipate and track these objects, particularly, he told me, coming in and out of the ocean south of Florida. He wouldn't tell me exactly where, but he told me that the person that he spoke to was a, a technician on board a surveillance aircraft that was diverted from its normal um, role, monitoring communications in Cuba, uh, to do monitoring in an area of ocean south of Florida. And of course, that's the Bermuda Triangle and raises all sorts of mysterious question marks there. But I've since uh, spoken to other multiple sources. <clears throat> and yes, I have said previously uh, that one source told me that um, there was an effort being made to use this same capacity to track the phenomenon to potentially bring it down. And I was told that there was an effort underway uh, I was told this uh, a few months ago now, but that, that was an effort underway off the east coast of America uh, to bring down objects using technology. Now, uh, in response to that, on a private message board, apparently Eric Davis has said that's not the case. And all I can say to that is I, I sure hope that's the case. I, I, I sure hope that's true because I, I dread to think of the possibilities if this is intelligent life that we're acting offensively against it. And I don't see why we would need to do that. Um, I just don't know. But I mean, essentially, all I can do is put out there what I'm told by sources. And yes, sources have told me that we do, we've long had the capacity to track. Uh, and indeed, the word I was told was anticipate um, the arrival of these objects because they generate a certain electromagnetic frequency. And um, uh, I was also told that there's been recent efforts or consideration to recent efforts to actually consider bringing down these objects. Mm. Now, that's been, uh, I'm told, I don't think he said this publicly, but I'm told Eric said this on a private message board that I was briefed about that uh, he said that wasn't the case. And I, I sure hope that's, that, that that is true. Mm. That's powerful. It, it is fascinating, this idea that it, they do emanate a certain frequency and that we could pr track and predict. It would, it does, it is interesting though for... And, and, and sorry, and can I interrupt there for a moment? Yeah. Um, there is actually a 1957 paper that I could send to you guys where uh, I think it was, it was referring to a 1957 incident, but it was published many years later uh, when it was declassified. And it actually talks about some of these frequencies. And it's quite fascinating because, again, you know, you've got a degree of openness in your military and in your intelligence services in those early days of the phenomenon where they were openly talking about the fact that they were tracking these objects and that they could pick up these frequencies. And that was back in the 1950s, for heaven's sake. So imagine what's happening now, a half a century later, over half a century later. Are you familiar with this idea of von Neumann probes? I've heard of them. I don't. I wouldn't pretend to know a lot about them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically just the idea that uh, it, it could be self-replicating AI technology from another civilization rather than sending biological, uh, you know, bodies. They would send AI or or self-replicating probes, and that would be that would be kind of fascinating. And that would might even make a little bit of sense as to why we would even be able to track this frequency. When why wouldn't they just change the frequency had they noticed we were tracking them? <laughs> Uh, well, I think you're assuming that they're capable of changing the frequency. Maybe oh, yeah, it's a product. A of, maybe it's a product of whatever the propulsion system is that it just by its very nature emits that frequency. I I, I just don't know. I'm not in a right. position to be able to explain that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've I've heard that probes theory, and I guess if you think about it, if you were a 
non-human civilization wanting to understand this planet, the best way to do that would be to send probes, especially when we go off playing with matches and setting off nuclear bombs. <laughs> um, can we ask a couple of these super chat questions here? Sure. Um, so James Doyle with a $10 super chat. Thank you so much. Will the UAP topic be magnified through the lens of advanced drone warfare as tensions heat up in the South Pacific? I think the advanced drone vid on the truck was allowed to be leaked for this reason. I'm not sure what video he's referring to there on the truck, but but I, I definitely understand the question with, with the drone issue that we're having. Look, one of the things that I think we should all take very, very seriously is the possibility that what we're looking at here in some cases is advanced drone technology that's being developed in the black. Um, Tyler Rogaway from the Warzone, the Drive column online, done some fantastic work on drones. Yeah. And he's hinted he's hinted very strongly that, do you remember all those Colorado swarms where there were all these weird drone objects being seen all around remote parts of the Midwest? And, uh, you know, there was no doubt people were seeing them and there was no doubt that they appeared to have some kind of intelligent control behind them. I've got some reason to believe that at least part of what we include within that broad description of the phenomenon is drone technology that's being developed in the black by the US. And if you think about it, it's, it makes a lot of sense that, oh, yeah. that, you know, we would be developing advanced AI drone technology, perhaps self-navigating drone technology um, that's tasked with a particular purpose. Um, it's quite frightening, I guess, but, you know, they've got to test it somewhere. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't rule that out as a possibility. And I, I think everybody should keep an eye on what Tyler Rogaway has been writing in uh, the drive, the Warzone column. Well, he just wrote a really, no, it wasn't a Tyler Rogaway, but it was posted on the drive uh, about uh, Congressman Mark Walker, who's on the Terrorism and Counterintelligence uh, Committee. He's actually the head of the committee, and um, he's now publicly come out basically saying that he's demanding uh, from these intelligence communities more information more data more transparency um and <clears throat> he had four particular questions that he wanted answered on the topic uh so yeah i think the drive is doing some wonderful wonderful work uh, william edwards uh photographic with a five dollar donation asks speaking of how put off an eric davis can you guys speak about their involvement with sapphire uh it deserves a deep dive doesn't it question mark <laughs> Yeah, the, the Sapphire project, for those in your audience that aren't aware of it, is a uh, ongoing scientific research project that's privately run that um, I think they're based in just across the border in Canada. And they've been claiming some quite extraordinary results in videos that they've published online, some of which they've since redacted in order to hide some of the things that clever people were making observations about. One of the things that really leapt out at me from what they've been claiming is at one stage, uh, one of the scientists behind the project was making assertions that they were detecting a anti-gravitic effect between the poles on the um, uh, the terminals inside the, the reactor that they're using. But essentially, they've been also claiming that they're generating more energy out than in, which of course is the holy grail of new energy technology. And um, what the principle that they work on, they, they've talked about what they describe as the electric sun model, which is immediately leapt upon by a lot of scientists with mock ridicule and, you know, they just treat it with nonsense, the electric sun model. But what really is at the heart of what they're claiming is that instead of having to use a tokamak magnetic reactor or something like that to contain a fusion reaction. They've learned a way of generating self-contained plasmas, uh, which essentially defy the, the reactions that you'd expect with um, polarities. You'd expect them all to repel Aspersion each other. Aspersion and, but, and but, entropy? But essentially, yeah, essentially it's, it's a form of self-contained plasma. Uh, and you can just go onto the Sapphire, S-A-F-I-R-E project.org, uh, I think it is. But uh, it's quite fascinating because they're now on their scientific advisory board. I know Eric Davis and Hal Putoff have taken a very close interest, as is now certain 
three letter agencies and uh, the Department of Energy. I think Lockheed Martin's got a, an oar in there as well. And they are one of the technology companies which is claiming to be developing uh, plasmas, which a lot of people have privately suggested to me might explain the objects that we see in the phenomenon. Uh, you know, could it could it be that that this plasma technology is a way of distorting space time? I, I, I don't know, and I don't pretend to know. But essentially, um, I, I do think, and people have impressed upon me that it's something that should be looked at very, very closely. There's other people as well. There's a guy called Andrea Rossi who's made claims that he's going to be unveiling his technology. Uh, uh, I think later on in November this year. And he's claiming also that he's generating more energy out than in. Um, certainly, a lot of this goes back as well to the claims, the very, very controversial claims of cold fusion technology made by Martin uh, Fleischmann and Pons, you know, back in the 1980s that were long discredited by conventional mainstream science. And I think one of the things that is very unscientific is the way that a lot of people in science immediately default to an argumentum ad hominem and attacking the person and not right. the fact and issue uh, when they look at the claims being made by organisations like Sapphire. Uh, it's very easy for mainstream science to allow itself to be, I hope, misconstrued as being arrogant or hubristic in its dismissal of the potential from such technologies. And I think we should engage scientifically with the claims that are being made by people like Sapphire, because I have just a hunch there might be something to it. Mm. And, and I, I think uh, it's yeah, so, sorry, real, real quick, real quick, before you read that, Super Chai, I think it's yeah. worth uh, uh, bearing in mind too. When we talk about the the phenomenon in UAP, you know, we have so many different buckets when we're considering what we deem as unidentified. Some people, you know, if you look at the Hesdell and Lights, um, those tend to be very plasma based, um, you know, objects. And then you've got things like the Tic Tac, and then you've got drones. So there's a there's a whole lot of different buckets that we should be considering. But I think it's fascinating too, when you look at something like the Hesdell and Lights, what relationship that has to things like the Sapphire Project and what can we learn from these potentially natural phenomena or 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 not natural phenomena, but how we can use those for science and, and discovering and unraveling this mystery of energy. I agree, absolutely agree. I mean, I, I, one of the things, I, I, I really get annoyed with some of the figurehead iconic mainstream scientists who allow themselves to be perceived as arrogant in their dismissal of edge scientific claims that are pushing the boundaries of known science, when frankly, the absurdity is we're at a time in science where probably never before since the Enlightenment has there been so much groundbreaking challenges to notions of accepted mainstream science by science? You know, you've got, <laughs> you know, you've got quantum physics, which completely turns on its head a lot of the Newtonian understandings of the world. And we're still trying to work on a unified field theory that explains all of that in a way that modern physics can grapple with. You know, there is a uh, square peg round hole thing here where clearly our understanding of Newtonian physics doesn't fit yet with what science is suggesting to us is theoretically possible. You know, I, I was just reading or trying to read the other day again a, a paper on the Alcubia drive, a drive that postulates a way to essentially create a space-time bubble in front of a craft that might allow you to, while you're not travelling faster than light, nobody can breach that um, that impossible barrier. Um, it might provide an explanation for how a craft might be able to traverse the universe. I mean, scientists are now saying that this is or postulating that this is theoretically possible. Could it be that some of these groundbreaking technologies are just scratching at the door of opening to the possible? 
And and could it be that the people that have their heads up their asses at the moment in mainstream science are not engaging in a broad-minded enough way to consider those possibilities? Uh, you know, I've, I, 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 I'm amazed sometimes at the way that mainstream science allows itself to be perceived as arrogant and dismissive and as the gatekeeper of knowledge, mm. when frankly, science by definition is all of us. All of us can be scientists. All of us can use the same skill sets to objectively analyze and apply a hypothesis to a, you know, to a, a theory and, and try and work and confirm that hypothesis. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I have a real bee in my bonnet about this because the, um, the thing that really strikes me is how many people that I've spoken to in confidential chats who've intimated to me that some of these technologies like Sapphire, like Andrea Rossi, like the whole notion of self-contained plasmas, that they're the key and that, 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 that that's it. And we need to go there and look closely. And what really makes me laugh is you've got mainstream science going, oh, it's all bullshit. You know, no, not going there. You know, we know, we know. And absolutely, I have got my degrees and my letters after my name, and I know exactly what I'm talking about. So go away and, you know, humor me with something else. And and really, it's it's arrogance. It is. And it's, it almost it reminds me of what we talked about at the top of the show, the fallacy fallacy, presuming that because a claim has been poorly argued or a fallacy has been made that it is necessarily wrong. And this is what academia is rife with. And it's such a frustration of mine. Ross, I, I'm going to have to have you like be the spokesperson for this show, because that's what we're all about here is allowing people to have ideas, think critically outside of the constraints that so often are, are put on them by, by the mainstream. Well, it's like there's a guy here in Australia and he he's won a lot of plaudits, quite rightly, for his discovery that ulcers weren't caused by stress. You know, he, he basically believed it was um, some kind of an infection or, 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 or some, you know, something that essentially you caught. And everybody thought it was bullshit. And so to prove his point, he glugged down what he knew was contaminated with the ulcer concoction and, and gave himself ulcers. And that has completely revolutionized scientific understanding of ulcers. You know, sure. it's just a small example. Right. But, but um, you know, he was roundly mocked for years. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, is a sad story that's told here in Australia a lot is the guys who essentially developed the the technology of gene shears, the capacity to splice DNA, they were Australian. They were Australian scientists, and they tried to interest venture capitalists here in Australia in their idea, and they were laughed at, they were poo-pooed, they were ignored. So as often happens, they took it overseas, yeah. and it was bought up by American companies, and now the whole CRISPR technology, the whole technology of recombinant, you know, bolting bits of DNA together – that that's been lost from Australia, you know, and and science again had its head up its ass and basically ignored the issue. And uh, uh, you know, one of the things in journalism and in in policing as well, I've talked to copper friends, policeman friends who talk about this, is they might be investigating a murder, and you get a thing called confirmational bias. Yes, you know, you just know it's that guy, <laughs> and 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 and. And one of the things they often do in an investigation is they bring in somebody to completely independently come in and appraise the evidence. And then they, they will often go, you know, you say it's that guy, but what about this guy over here? And, and then they'll realize that they've been barking up the wrong tree all this time. Humans, including scientists, are guilty of confirmational bias. We, we reinforce our own prejudices and those prejudices Sometimes, even though they're, um, we don't even realize that we're having them, you know, they might be racially driven, they might be culturally driven, you know, we have a bias that, that we have to challenge all the time. And in investigative journalism, that's what I've learned. I've learned to do that all the time, that, that you, you, you have to be often quite unpopular because somebody will tell you something and uh, I'll go, yeah, are you sure? Like, for example, um, global warming science, 
you know, at, at risk of, and I mean, it's such a hot potato, and especially in journalism, you know, you just don't go there. But <laughs> the lies that have been told about global warming science in order to perpetuate the myth that the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change is a genuine consensus of concerned scientists, all unambiguously agreeing that the science is very, very clear that there is human-caused global warming. Fundamentally, that is dishonest, the science that is being expressed to express that point of view. And I, there was a turning point for me when I realized this, where I was doing a TV show and I was interviewing John Zillman, who was the head of the Met Office in Australia, the Meteorological Office. And he was one of the signatories of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I was taking him through one of, back 20 or so years ago, back through one of the very early reports from the IPCC. And I said, do you agree with that? And he went, no. And I went, but you're here as one of the signatories to the IPCC on human-caused global warming. He went, well, I, I don't accept the science. And it made me realise that whilst I personally do believe in anthropogenic global warming, and you might notice I say belief, I don't say no, I've, I've essentially abandoned my knowledge because it's just too vast a subject to try and get over. And I've accepted that mainstream science generally agrees by consensus that there is anthropogenic global warming. But what I do think is that mainstream science has allowed itself to become part of a political campaign that has allowed science to be misused in a way that in order to drive what they perceive as the imperative of addressing promptly the need to address anthropogenic global warming, they've papered over the cracks in the consensus and they've misrepresented the extent to which science actually agrees. And, and one of the turning points for me was where I realized that the mathematical models that were being used to predict future global warming, the extent of rates of global climate change, were fundamentally dishonest and that the data in, you know, garbage in, garbage out, the data, the data that was going into these computer models was misleading. And as a result, mainstream science was allowing itself to be misused to misrepresent essentially a propaganda initiative to push the idea that, yes, we have to respond urgently to anthropogenic climate change. And privately, there are, ever since I did that story, there are a lot of scientists who keep in touch with me. Uh, one of them was a guy, sadly, passed away not long ago, Carrie Mullis, the Nobel Prize winner. And, um, you know, he was a real skeptic about climate change and uh, anthropogenic climate change. And he got howled down by the scientific consensus just for pointing out obvious flaws in the mathematical algorithms that have been used to support claims that were being made to predict global warming. And when 10 years on, those predictions didn't happen, science looked bad because of it. Right. And, and th this is the problem, is that we live in a society where science has been politicized. And coming back to the UFO issue for a moment, um, science is being politicized on the subject of UAPs. I mean, I'm in no doubt whatsoever that historically, some of the people who were the chief scientific debunkers back in the 50s and the 60s were in the thrall of some of your intelligence services. Um, and it's a matter of public record that they were people with security clearances that they hadn't disclosed. They had links to the CIA or the Defence Intelligence Agency. And these people were some of the chief debunkers who were going around poo-pooing, taking the subject of UAP seriously. Why? Why was there such an active campaign run through the media to shut down public commentary and public awareness on the subject of UAPs? This demands explanation. And if science was good science, not immediately defaulting to a position of ridicule, it would realise that it's now gone beyond that point where it can just dismissively go, ah, oh, it's all rubbish. I know better than you, you know, couldn't possibly be alien, you know, couldn't possibly be a paranormal explanation. <clears throat> We're beyond that now. The Pentagon has formally admitted that there is a technology operating in our skies, in our oceans, in our orbit, which is way beyond known technology. It's doing speeds, maneuvers, intelligently controlled, 
It's doing the five observables, as Lou Elizondo has described them, and we can't explain it. The moment that concession was made by the Pentagon, I think in April 2020, everything changed. And I don't think the mainstream media or establishment science have woken up to that yet. That's the difference. Well, could it right. be because the <laughs> Pentagon has a credibility issue? Oh, uh, look, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, look, you know, I, would, uh, I like to think the best of our military leaders, right. okay? You know, they lied, they, or they allowed themselves to be lied to when they went into Iraq. That's a sad fact. But the, uh, the reality is that I don't know any, I mean, I, lo I know a lot of generals and a lot of intelligence officials. It's my job to keep in touch with them and to talk to them in your country and in mine. And there's a lot of goodwill towards Australia because we've been your loyal little ally running along to every little war with you for the last, <laughs> for the last hundred years. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of goodwill. And as a result, a lot of uh, particularly former serving military officials and intelligence officials have spoken to me privately about the UAP issue when they probably normally wouldn't have done to a, another journalist. And it, uh, it's interesting because they're not saying privately what is the military position publicly. I'm, I'm getting terrible... I'm getting terrible feedback from an aeroplane here. Airplane, yeah, that's is, that, what I heard. is that here? Where is that? No, I don't yeah, think yeah, that, that might be me. Oh, oh that's, yep. oh, okay. there that's you yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the upshot is, um, I, all I'm saying is that for political reasons, the issue of UAPs has been suppressed as a legitimate subject for debate by both mainstream science and by the mainstream media. And there was a turning point that I cite in my book where in Scientific American, two scientists acknowledged this is no longer sustainable. Right. We now have to acknowledge this is a genuine mystery. It is worthy of scientific and media investigation. Right. And, and you have this important point when it comes to science, right? I, th I think the problem here is that we treat people like dummies. And even if we – the fact that we don't give them – all of the science and all of the data when we do have a specific political agenda. For example, let's, real quick, just to just to hit back on your point about anthropomorphic climate change, right? We know that it's a good idea to reduce our carbon footprint regardless sure. of whether or not climate change is anthropomorphic. We do know that there are an incredible amount of studies that point to the fact that it is related to carbon our carbon emissions, but when Be there is beyond other any science- doubt. When there is other science that has different results and different models, we ignore that because we don't want to confuse the dummies. I think that's the problem. And then because we don't yeah. want to confuse the dummies, then we have the conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. going, oh, see, see, they lied to us. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as global warming. And now you have this yeah. horrible echo chamber going through social media and it's a freaking problem. We got to tr stop treating people like dummies, give them all the information and let's say, okay, now let's come to a consensus. But I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But it, it's like, I mean, I, I have a bee in my bonnet because I actually did a story about it once about the world trade center collapse. And, uh, you know, we looked as an investigation uh, into the story that, you know, there was a deliberate controlled explosion because I've had so many people over the years contact me with this paranoid conspiracy theory that the government blew up its own World Trade Center and instigated a, a Gulf of Tonkin style terror attack to justify going to war. And I'm very satisfied it's bullshit. But I know, as I say this, that all over America, there are people who regard themselves as being very scientifically driven, who will go, that Coulthard doesn't know what he's talking about, you know, oh, bloody fire, 500 <laughs> pages of documents at him. And, and I will, I'll, I'll now get, no doubt, a lot of outraged people who will tell me that they believe that there was a government conspiracy to blow up the World Trade Center. And, um, you know, I mean, I lost friends in that terrible tragedy. And but I it's think just, that's also it's, because it's, they didn't give us the whole picture. It's, it's the same thing with global warming. They're giving us the, the, the watered-down information that allows people to, to, to go to these conspiracy yeah. holes. Well, I mean, look at the whole JFK story. I mean, you, right. know, the, 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 you know, you had people from the JFK Commission itself admitting that the whole thing was a bloody cover-up, and there's never been a satisfactory public um, accounting of all of the data that shows that, you know, the CIA was much more involved in all of this than it cares to publicly admit. Um, and... 
you know, I don't think we'll ever know, frankly. I don't think we'll ever know the full story about the JFK story. But I mean, I think the 9-11 Commission was a, was a, a righteous attempt to try and correct the scientific misapprehensions about why the World Trade Center collapsed, but it was done far too late and too little. And it allowed itself to be politicized in a way that frankly has just done more to fuel the conspiracy theories. And it, it really worries me because the paranoid fringe in American society, that whole cult of conspiracy is actually quite scary. I mean, I, I, I am, I'm amazed by how angry and aggressive people get when they engage with journalists like me on some of these issues, you know, and it, it, it does make you think twice sometimes about engaging with the subject matter on right. UFOs, for example, you know, I've, I've had some seriously angry, aggressive people, and I'm glad I'm not in the room with them <laughs> engaging with me furious because, um, you know, some people thought that I was uh, completely dismissively asserting that all abductees were um, liars or hoaxes. I'm not. All I've said about abductions is I just don't understand it. I don't know enough about it. I'm not in a position to be able to look at any data, data to be able to scientifically assess it. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is, we have to stick to evidence. It's as simple as that. It's like with any investigative story or with any criminal investigation, you know, you can't work on your gut just because something feels right, just because you intuitively feel that this is what happened to you or that's the best explanation for this phenomena. You have to go on evidence and, and witness evidence is important, but I look for multiple corroboration. I look for ways of verifying that evidence. And so that's why, for example, to come back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of all of this, the blurry photographs and videos that a lot of people send journalists like me, I, I can't do much with them because they don't prove anything without their provenance, you know, unless I'm standing there looking at that object and getting the same sensations that they're getting and getting the same data, data then uh, bottom line is, it's next to useless. And yeah. uh, and frankly, I think it's suited. This is really interesting because if you think about why we're now where we are, I reckon the reason we are now where we are is because technology caught up with the lie. Because for all the attempts to cover up the sensor systems that we now have on modern aircraft, particularly fighter attack jets, you know, they've got these phased array radar systems, which are phenomenal pieces of kit. And in 2004, they only had them on the USS Princeton in that battle fleet and on, I think, also the E-2 Hawkeye aircraft. They didn't have them on the fighter jet that Dave Fravor and Alex Dietrich were flying. But um, they do now. And I think because those sensor systems incontrovertibly showed objects doing weird things, that couldn't be denied for the first time and were seen by so many people, so many independent witnesses. It's kind of forced the Pentagon's hand in a way. And I think that's going to happen more and more. You know, a lot of people say to me, why, 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 you know, in an era where everybody has a phone camera, you know, these little phones that we have on our phones, our cameras we have on our phones. And everybody says to me, you know, why haven't we recorded good quality video? These are crap cameras. They really are. <laughs> but I mean, we're still dealing really with are. we're still dealing with just uh, no evidence, right? I mean, we don't have access to those radar stuff. We're dealing with just the eyewitness testimony from the people who observed well, that stuff. Well, actually, Bob Fish said to me, this to me the other day. He said, "Look, nobody, as far as I can see, has actually FOI'd the Pentagon and asked for any telemetry data on the electromagnetic frequencies that were picked up on the Tic Tac." Or for that matter, from the Theodore Roosevelt. Everybody's I'm been shocked, focused on the. Event. I'm like somebody called John Greenwald yeah, right I'm now. Yeah. <laughs> Get on here, John. Get, yeah. Um, but, or, but no, or I mean, I, I, oh no, oh no. My phone's calling John Greenwald. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But no, I mean seriously, I, I mean, we. We are only ever going to get to the bottom of this. Like a, a mate of mine, John Davies, who lives in Wales, he is fascinated by an event that took place in 1983 called the Night of the Black Triangles all over England and Europe. 
And uh, I, I did a story about it actually for Australian TV. And we interviewed, I think in one case, a former RAF, former Royal Air Force Wing Commander who'd seen one of these objects. Numerous witnesses had seen weird, gigantic hovering black triangles all over the United Kingdom, but particularly around a part of Wales in January 1983. And John, just uh, about a week ago, sent me a really, really interesting document, which was a printout from the British National Archives. And it shows that whatever the US government, sorry, whatever the UK government has on those black triangle sightings, they are locked up until 2087. So they locked it up for a hundred plus more years. evidence we don't have, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Now, oh. It's interesting because, I mean, uh, he told me that apparently um, one uh, British commentator has asserted that maybe it's because there's private information. And that sounds semi plausible. You know, they might be identifying things that allow people to be identified and we shouldn't harass them until they're long gone. Now, my understanding of the National Archives Act is quite good because I've done many, many National Archives applications, both in the UK, the US, Australia. Personal uh, exemptions like that only apply for 30 years. The 30-year mm -hmm. rule is, is the thing that applies in Commonwealth countries like Australia and uh, the UK. And I've obtained classified files that have got the names of Special Forces soldiers in them from Australia's National Archives that have been declassified from the 1980s. So that excuse doesn't hold water. So why? Why would the British government lock up files for over 100 years? Now, I wager most mainstream journalists in the United Kingdom are completely unaware of the fact that the British National Archives is locking up files for over 100 years relating to UFO sightings. But I know, because I've done stories about it, that the British media have done stories about how the story of um, Prince Edward and Mrs Simpson, the decision by the British sovereign to give up his crown and move in with an American woman and move to France and the history of his collaboration with the Nazis and his friendship with Adolf Hitler. A lot of those files were locked up by the British government in an act of pomp pompous over secrecy. Uh, they were also locked up for a hundred years and because of the public outcry, including there was an embargo here in Australia where, where the files on Edward and Mrs. Simpson and the circumstances under which the British government briefed the Australian government of the decision by Edward to stand down from his crown were locked up for a century. And there was such an outcry about it that the archives finally revealed and released the files preemptively. Now, I'll wager if the British media did the same thing, if, say, Ben McIntyre, who does a lot of national security stuff of the London Times, wrote a piece saying, why is it that the Knight of the Triangles is classified for a hundred years? And just did a story asking that question. <laughs> I'll wager, I'll wager somebody in British Whitehall would go, oh dear, we've got some guy from the Times basically saying we should we should maybe uh, open up our files. And and ultimately this is how you apply pressure. The right. media applies pressure. And normally it's some pompous fuckwit bureaucrat who basically decides that, oh, this is embarrassing to Her Majesty. We're going to we're going to sit on it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 you know, bottom line is the only way that you can generate momentum on this issue is by basically pushing, being a mongrel, you know, asking unpopular questions. That's what that's what investigative journalism is all about. And it's what good journalism should be all about. And my, my gripe with the mainstream media is they've had the rug pulled over their eyes, the wool pulled over their eyes to the extent that they just automatically, to the large degree, default to ridicule. And uh, it's, it's absurd now in the light of current acknowledgements by the Pentagon for that position to be maintained. But equally, it's absurd when you read the British Ministry of Defence's own report, the Condine report, where it clearly 
engaged with the phenomenon extremely seriously and acknowledged the reality of objects doing exactly the same thing as the Tic Tac 50 years earlier. Now, Which, why? that ain't drones, friends. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and and, and, and the, the, you, you asked me, you know, what, what was it that was the thing that made me start to take this seriously? It was that kind of stuff where you go, okay, there's a cognitive dissonance here. There's an irrationality between the media's position, the stated default ridicule position of the media, and the evidence. If somebody can show me why this evidence should be ridiculed, you know, for example, the Raf Bentwaters story, the Charles, everybody knows the Charles Holt 1980, Christmas 1980 story, but a lot of people don't know the story of an earlier incident at the Raf Bentwaters base in the United Kingdom in Suffolk, uh, bit, oh gosh, sometime in the 1950s, when again, multiple radar systems picked up a craft, a jet fighter. It was almost analogous to the uh, David Fravor incident. And I tell this story in my book. Um, you know, a Dave Fravor style fighter pilot was sent up to investigate and, and, and intercept this, whatever it was. And he came back completely freaked out by the experience because whatever it was, it was avoiding him. It was engaging intelligently. And it's one of the sole incidents that both Project Blue Book and the Condon Report, which was an appalling whitewash by the US Air Force, they had to admit they couldn't explain. Mm. And and that's that's the thing that really blows me away about this is that there is a, um, a cognitive dissonance between what the public are being told about the phenomenon and what we should really acknowledge is on the on the evidence, even on the most boring conservative evidence that's there in dusty government files, the evidence is irrefutable. There is a real phenomenon. It cannot be denied. Here in America, we would say that there is a there there. <laughs> yeah. <Let's>, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, real quick, I've got, uh, and I know we got to be respectful of your time, Ross. I know you've, you've been here almost two hours and, and you woke up an extra hour early extra for us. Hour, yeah. yeah sorry about that <laughs> um but my god thank you so much for for your time with us but real quick we've got two two last questions uh two last super chats and then uh, i want to make sure people know exactly where to go find your book because you can now get a paperback or hardcover in the u.s can they get a hardcover too, or just uh, I, I i i think it i think they're doing hardcover and paperback in the u.s it's coming out on the 12th of october in the united states and canada that's fantastic um, so Darren Plain asks, should we concentrate on getting the nuts and bolts disclosure out front and center first, and then we can explore wider theories that could connect once it is declassified? Look, it's a good question. Darren's an Aussie. G'day, Darren. Um, look, <laughs> the, 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 the problem is I'm not convinced, despite all the positive comments coming from people like Lou Elizondo and Christopher Mellon and you know, the incredibly optimistic assessments from people in Congress, I'm not convinced we are going to see any more disclosure than what we've seen to date. Mm -hmm. I think the Pentagon would think that it has made a disclosure. It, it has disclosed that there is a reality here that for much of the last 70 something years, it's been ignoring. I mean, essentially, it's done a double backflip with Pike after decades of denials asserting that there is no threat to national security, no risk to flight safety. It's actually formally admitted that there is a risk to flight safety and a potential threat to national security. That, by any definition, is quite a significant disclosure. Right. My worry is, though, that, that if we don't keep on pushing and keep on needling, what they're trying to do is control the narrative because my gut instinct was recently confirmed to me by my own sources that what's happening here is they're trying to, by constraining the UAP task force report to reporting incidents from the 2004 USS Nimitz incident, it's not just convenient for them, it's also great because it means they don't have to talk about all of the alleged crash retrievals that supposedly happened in the 40s, 50s and 60s. And you know, people have told me flatly that there were multiple crash retrievals. Eric Davis has gone on the record to say there were multiple crash retrievals. Congress, no less. Your Congress, your parliament, your government has been briefed formally by people that there have been multiple crash retrievals. 
what the hell's going on? Why is this not a, a big issue? So my worry is that, yes, disclosure has been made, but that effectively um, uh, we're not going to get much more unless we keep on needling. It has to be a political issue for the politicians to think, you know what, we can't bullshit them anymore on this because the public's really angry about this. You know, we, we, there's no way we can con control this because people should be angry. You have been being lied to for years. You have, categorically, on the, on the evidence, without any shadow of a doubt, you've right. been being lied to. There's been a cover-up. I'm in absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, but the issue is now, is the current talk of disclosure merely an attempt by officialdom to constrain the narrative? For example, when the US Air Force was so clearly through the general and other people talking Tom DeLong, trying to pre-brief both DeLong and Hillary Clinton's campaign in anticipation of her becoming president. Were they actually trying to pre-brief to set the ground for a disclosure that they could control? And now that that event has passed because Hillary didn't become president. And I hope people know what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the WikiLeaks emails that showed that there was communication between senior members of the US Air Force and Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, John Podesta, and, um, and Tom DeLong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, and irrefutably, they were talking about disclosure. Was that an attempt by the Air Force, knowing that it was inevitable, in their mind anyway, at least at the time, that Hillary Clinton was going to become president? Were they trying to feed DeLong with information that allowed the public to be prepared for the narrative that they wanted presented? And if that's the case, was that a truthful narrative? Was it really the case that what Tom was being told was entirely truthful? Because right. we have to be sceptical. Right. Well, the beautiful thing is, is that I don't think this conversation is going to go away from a political perspective, just because now, because of H.R. 4350 and S-2610, we're going to get a permanent office uh, of UAP. We're going to get Congress, at least, is going to get up to four reports a year for the next four years. Um, so I think I think the conversation is just now starting to get get cooking from a political perspective. I mean, like I said, just the other day, earlier in the conversation, uh, Mark Walker, a congressman, he, he, out of a, he, is, he is out of a committee that has never spoken uh, on this topic at all. That's the Terrorism and Counterintelligence Committee. You know, like that's that's a brand new committee to this conversation. And you've got the, the speaker of that committee uh, on the forefront putting it out in the open. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, and also just wanted to hit up because uh, it was a $5 super chat that I just can't get to, but it was from um, Sean Rosh, uh, witness citizen. And he wanted to thank you for, for retweeting uh, his efforts that he had just put out on his website. And also oh, he did a, he did a great kind of work. 70 yeah. more pages here in the next couple of days. So uh, to well, sure. Witness citizen and everybody should have a look at his Twitter site because mm -hmm. he's done a phenomenal piece of work where he's shown that a lot of what we're talking about today is somehow revelatory. They know the right. tic tac, the hypersonic speeds. It's all there in the yeah. archives. And so he's pulled together 70 well recorded historical events that are in your archives, irrefutable evidence that shows that, you know, what we're talking about now happened 50 years ago. No, he's doing amazing work. Um, and well the done, last John. question from, uh, from from John Music, my previous super chat, what do you think of the public reaction would be to admitting that the abduction slash missing people slash DNA manipulation, returned dead people, uh, mutilations have been going on, total panic? Or do you think there'd be total panic if they admitted those one of those four things? Well, you know what I think? I think, <laughs> I think one... One of the problems we have at the moment is there is a crisis in trust, both in the media and in politics. Right. We've never before had such a low level of public approval of either institution. And frankly, the fact that shows like yours exist online is a reflection of the failure 
by conventional media to recognise that there is a public demand for information on the subject of UAPs. You know, you guys are fulfilling an extremely important need that the mainstream media is, through ignorance, ignoring. And and the reality is that, um, you know, we're we've allowed ourselves to be manipulated. So there is a crisis in public confidence. So frankly, as I say in my book, even if the government did come out and say tomorrow, look, uh, we lied, Uh, we've been lying to you for years. You know what I reckon? I reckon a lot of the people in the public might go, oh yeah, so what? We we expect governments to lie. Governments lie all the time. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've been told things, and I, I hate to do this because it sounds coy, but I mean, I, I have been told things about what might be an explanation for the phenomenon, which is a bit scary, you know, and it doesn't involve particularly nice explanations for the human race. And it goes back in history, you know, the, essentially the notions of human origins and what we are and why we are. And Maybe people might be confronted about that, especially if they're deeply religious, to know that we're essentially bits of tinkered DNA. Do Would think, we panic? Right. No, that's, that's fair. Do you think it's? Um, I mean, from from uh, you know the archives and our and our experiences and the stories we hear, it seems like there we're rel- they're relatively we're relatively innocuous. To them, is this? I mean, in your opinion, and I know you 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 alluded to some things that that people have told you, but like in your opinion, in your in your in your heart of hearts, Ross, do you do you think this is something that we should be afraid of? No, not really. I mean, I, I don't buy the Stephen Greer happy clappy lovey lovey. You know, it's all peace and love uh, because I I do. I mean, I've I don't want to sound melodramatic, but I've seen so much evil in my life as a journalist. I've you know. You know, some of our great religious institutions have systemically allowed the abuse of children. Um, you know, evil's everywhere. So yeah. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised at all if um, uh, you know there are malevolent non-human intelligences as much as there are good ones. But frankly, if something with this degree of technological superiority wanted to stomp on us like an ant, it could have done it thousands of years ago. And uh, I'm I'm an incurable optimist. You know, I, I I love the idea that that more excitingly, human endeavor might expose an, an understanding of the world in perhaps even months or years that is just revolutionary, and that we might embrace and begin to understand new technologies that that are hopefully going to take us to the stars and allow us to understand our universe. Who in science wouldn't want <laughs> wouldn't that? Wouldn't want that, you know, yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe you know, his, na- his name rhymes with uh, Schmiel de Glass Chrysan. Um, <laughs> I, I don't understand it, uh, but I've got one last question for you. This is the sixth book you've written. And you've written about motorcycle gangs, uh, caches of World War II photographs, is first is this your favorite book that you've ever written and do yeah. you see yourself writing about anything else because <laughs> i feel like this is you're interested in this this genuinely perplexes you so i'm curious are we going to get more books is ross going to go back to motorcycle gangs or is this kind of it because i think this is the biggest story of our time no well look i can tell you writing a book is like i imagine for a woman and like having a baby uh mm-hmm. you know you, you, you love the you love the conception, but the the actual delivery is just awfully painful and upsetting. And uh, I I've, I want a holiday, you know, I really do. Right. And and the the thing though that I will tell you is the volume of not only information but goodwill. I mean, it's really lovely. I mean, I I've, I I love as a journo the response that I've got to this subject matter. I've never ever had a story that has drawn so much interest from literally everywhere in the world. Mm. There are Russians writing to me, Chinese people writing to me. Uh, There's a a Chinese person the other day volunteered to go up to their local nuclear test site and do some recceing for me to see if they were 
objects hovering over the test site. And I said, you're kidding me. And they went, no, no, I'm right near an ICBM missile silo. And so I'll go and I'll go and have a look for you. And they were really sweet, you know, and I'm so gratified that there are people all over the world who are engaged in a passionate way with this subject matter. And, um, for me as a journo as well, the other thing that I find interesting is it's a real mystery. Mm. You know, there are, there are a lot of things in journalism where you go, oh, God, this is so boring. You know, why am I doing another story on this? You know, and, and you just wish, oh, God, kill me now. You know, I really <laughs> don't care about this subject. You know, this is, this is everywhere you go. You know, every rock you turn over, there's something more. And uh, it is such verdant pasture. And even when you cut out the, the nonsense, the BS, the chaff, there is such a solid skein, a rich load of information to follow. And I'm kind of looking over my shoulder like this, waiting for the rest of the mainstream media to catch up because it's amazing. I mean, I... I uh, I, I was reading Ralph Blumenthal. I know you had Ralph on a few weeks ago, and I was reading Ralph's amazing book about John Mack. And, uh, you know, that's in itself an amazing story. You know, I mean, here's a, a Harvard professor of psychiatry who decided to engage with the abduction phenomenon and take it seriously. And, and he also did that amazing work at Rua in Zimbabwe with the alleged landing of a craft in that little school in Zimbabwe. I mean, these are amazing stories. They're compelling and they're fascinating and you can't discount them. And and I know there'll be people in science who just want to be able to go pompously, oh, you know, listen to me, you know, <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. I, I am the authority on science. And frankly, they're not. Yeah. And, and this is the thing that, one of the things I worry about in America in particular is you tend to put your scientists on a pedestal and especially on to come back to global warming science for a moment, they're often used like rock stars to mm -hmm. assert, you know, you cannot challenge the unimpeachable authority of this high priest of the faith. Of you know, too. yeah, science <laughs> by definition, science, scientists, good scientists are complete bitches to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, they're shafting each other all the time. <laughs> they take a malevolent delight in being able to poke a hole in each other's theory. It's fun. And it's what yeah. journos do too. And it's why I identify with them. Cops do it as well. Good cops. I instinctively click with the good cops because the good detectives are the ones who've developed an intuition for what we would call as journalists, a good story or what a scientist would call a good hypothesis. Your, your, in, your intuition works in the background, objectively analyzing data and then presents you with options and alternatives. And that's what I'm finding with the phenomenon is that, um, you know, barely a day goes by where some new thing comes in the door and I just, you know, I go outside and water my garden because I just can't, my brain cannot cope with the volume of ideas that are coming in. Yeah. And, and a lot of it's from scientists and military people and intelligence people who are contacting me uh, confidentially through manners and means that shall remain ever confidential. Uh, and I welcome it because, you know, they're wanting to intellectually engage. And I, I like to hope that what they've recognized in me is that I, I, I don't publish knowingly bullshit. You know, I, I do try and use a level of objective assessment on the evidence before I publish it. And uh, that should be the measure by how we all operate. And that's the change that needs to happen in the research into the phenomena. Well, there is a rumor uh, going around that when you do go on this well-deserved break, which, by the way, you do deserve, uh, that you'll be auditioning for uh, the, the replacement of Daniel Craig in the new 007 series. <laughs> is that true? Can you confirm or deny I this? I, I one, I'm too old, and two, I don't have the tummy muscles. You know, I, oh, I, I still. Man. All we all yeah, we need you. is a workout regimen, Ross, and I think you're in. 
I think you know, so don't you remember that first? Do you remember that first movie he was in where he walked out of the surf? And it's funny, every guy would actually have to admit it as well, as well as the women. <laughs> Everybody just went, Whoa. <laughs> Boy, but, would you know, I like and, a uh, piece of that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, uh, no, one thing I will definitely not do is a James Bond movie. But just to answer your question, I, I, I think eventually there will be another book and there definitely will be a another special. documentary. Yeah, oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait. Amazing, Ross. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I mean, you gave us two hours and eight minutes of your time, three if you include the extra hour that we screwed up by uh, by not knowing it was daylight savings time. Can you tell people, is there any more specific, do you want people to go to Amazon to buy your book? Do you have anywhere specific? You, do you, would you rather than go to your website? Where do you want site, to go, Book.com. Look, it's, I'm, I'm told by HarperCollins America that it's going to be in all good bookstores in America, mainly Barnes and & Noble and Amazon, uh, by 12th of October, which is only six days away, so next week. And uh, uh, it's already available in Audible and Kindle, but get one for your bookshelf. Get one for your bookshelf, and, uh, and you can pre-order now. Christmas presents. Christmas presents. You can actually go order it right now. You can pre-order it right now on Amazon as well. And if you really like uh, Ross's accent and the other <laughs> accents that he's done, he, do he, do he voices the audio for the audio book. So make sure you check that out as well. I honestly, can it's I, one of I... my favorite audio books that I've ever listened to. <laughs> can I just, I, I want to apologize here to Tom DeLong. On, on the record, I'm, I'm really, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I made him sound oh, like a twelve-year-old boy. <laughs> yeah, my goodness! But he's got Ross, that. Thank he's you got so that, much. He's got that childhood innocence. That's that's who Tom Long is. Yeah, 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 indeed. Um, well, thank you, Ross. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's always just a wonderful, wonderful uh, conversation every time you come by. Your wealth of knowledge, and and I love the fact that you don't know but you're still really passionate about it and, and you're a champion uh, for, for shows like this and, and people who are listening in the chat. I mean, we, we, we put you on a pedestal because you are a great journalist and, and, and we need, we gravitate toward folks like you because you add a lot of credibility and, uh, and, and your journalism to a topic that's super confusing. Um, and, Lacking and in it. Yeah. And lacks a lot of it. So appreciate it. Thank you very much for all of your support. All right, Thank so you we'll so much, you Ross. Soon. Bye bye. Oh, oh, I cut him off. Wait, wait, wait. You can say that one more time if you want. He said bye. I, I'm, I'm so awkward. <laughs> uh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, get out of here, Ross Goldberg. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what an amazing uh, Singularity Lab. Thank you so much for being here today. We really, really appreciate all your support. If you want to check us out, uh, if you want to listen to the audio while you're driving around, you know, just all you got to do is go to Apple Podcasts, go to Spotify. You can check out the Unidentified Celebrity Review and the Singularity Lab. Uh, also, make sure you check out Rather Be Squidding's channel uh, on YouTube. Rather, where can they find you? Yeah, at uh, Be Squidding on Twitter and uh, Rather Be Squidding on YouTube. Yeah, and don't forget to check out, uh, our, of course, our Patreon links. Uh, and thank you so much for all the super chats. All of all of those funds go to helping make the show better, uh, making sure that we can be available for shows. You know, in in for five days a week, essentially. Next week we're going to start uh, Miller's new show, which we're we're going to be talking about as soon as this show's over. But uh, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. That way you guys don't miss a show every time we do go live. And uh, and yeah, that's it. Michael. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Yep. Peace. Do you want to know about the future? I do. And I know you do too. <laughs> That's why we do what we do right here at the Singularity Lab, just for you. Do you want to know about stories about breaking technology? Science? Look right here. I'm looking at my sheet. Marty did it. Why can't you? Remember, this is a public access channel. We rely on your donations. So just hit the Patreon. So we can continue to bring you updated science and technology, breaking news every single day. <laughs>